On October 21, 1957, Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip visited New York City. It was the final stop on their tour. The next day, they returned to the UK. Meanwhile, in Washington, President Eisenhower was meeting with the UK's Prime Minister Harold Macmillan and NATO Chief Paul Henry Spock. Their chat was over Middle East policy, rocket deployment, and the Soviet Union's launch of Sputnik. On Friday, October 25th at 7.30 a.m., the NBC World News Roundup took to the air, talking of developments. This is Henry Cassidy in Radio Central New York. Now the NBC World News Roundup, major developments and on-the-spot reports by correspondents of NBC News. Here are the headlines. Washington, Eisenhower, Macmillan, Broaden Conference bring in NATO chief on rocket pool. London, Macmillan's power seen slumping as labor rights win by election for parliament. Cairo, Syria stands firm against Saudi Arabian mediation as United Nations resumes Mideast debate. Moscow, Sputnik losing a race being passed by its own rocket propeller. I'll be back in one minute with the NBC World News Roundup. The glamour backstage at Broadway's newest hit musical show, the spectacular West Side Story. The British and U.S. were butting heads over Middle East policy, while Britain wanted the two countries to share nuclear secrets. France was complaining that the U.S. and England weren't allowing technological access. NATO Chief Spock was expected to invite France to the upcoming talks. After this meeting, Prime Minister Macmillan was to give Canadian PM John Diefenbacher an in-person report on the talk. has planned for you beginning tonight. Gene Kelly, Milton Berle, Tab Hunter, and Tony Martin are among the celebrities who will be visiting you over the Monitor weekend. There will be comedy by Fibber McGee and Molly and Bob and Ray, music, news, and sports all on Monitor. So start your weekend right with Monitor on Friday night and stay with Monitor all weekend long over most of these same NBC radio stations. And now the NBC World News Roundup. If there have been any doubts among other allies, and there seem to have been some, about the meeting between President Eisenhower and Prime Minister Macmillan, they are being dispelled today. Paul Henri Spock of Belgium, Secretary General of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, has been invited to the White House. And this is taken as an indication that the other allies will be informed of and included in any new pool of scientific developments. There has been an impression in some other capitals, notably Paris, that they are being bypassed in the Washington conference. That is not the intent of those meeting in Washington, and the invitation to Spock may go far to correct that impression. As Secretary General of NATO, Spock is in a position to report to all 15 members of the Western Alliance. Moreover, after the final meeting this afternoon with President Eisenhower, Prime Minister Macmillan is flying to Canada, and in Ottawa he is expected to give Prime Minister Diefenbaker a full report on the Washington talks. Now for the final phase of the Washington conference, we switch immediately to Arthur Barrio of NBC News in Washington. It seems likely that before the end of the day we shall have a communique summarizing the Eisenhower-Macmillan talks, with heavy emphasis, of course, on the scientific aspects of the conference. Late as it may be, the United States and Great Britain now must try to do something to counter the Russian propaganda gains made by the launching of Sputnik, although the two countries are not concerned with satellites alone. There are here reports that Mr. McMillan has told us the British would like to see some of the 1,500-mile range missiles they were promised at the Bermuda Conference, also that they want a sort of international Manhattan Project, not unlike the one that developed our atom bomb, but one that for the moment is impossible because of our laws against sharing atomic secrets. We might swap missile information for some of Britain's atoms for peace data if the law ever is repealed. We might also today hear something of joint American-British plans for the Middle East. About the only agreement here lies in the fact that nothing the leaders of the two countries can say or do will bring about an immediate remedy. Something may be said along the lines of a joint economic aid program, a program designed to try to stop the economic gains the Russians have made in the Middle East. It's no secret the British have not liked our Middle East policy. Neither have the Americans made secret the fact they believe the British on occasion have been rather high-handed in that area, especially in the Suez Canal action of a year ago. But on this, the final day of the talks, signs are we may decide it will be to our interest to join hands scientifically and economically. This is Art Barrio, NBC News, Washington.
the Prime Minister's Conservative Party's grip was loosening. The Socialist Labour Party had recently taken a seat in the House of Commons, and the leaders of two major trade unions were going ahead with wage demands to counter inflation. While Prime Minister Macmillan has been engaged in diplomatic talks in Washington, his supporters have been involved in politics at home with some perhaps surprising results. Not that the Conservative government seems to be in any danger, another general election in Britain is not due before 1959, but the Conservative Party is having its troubles. We get that story from Bob Abernathy of NBC News in London. Prime Minister Macmillan's Conservative government has just suffered two more blows here at home. It's been roundly beaten in another special election for one seat in the House of Commons, and the leaders of two big trade union organizations have made it clear they have no intention of holding back their wage demands to help in the battle against inflation. The election was at Ipswich, about 70 miles north of London. The socialist candidate, Dingle Foote, won easily, doubling the previous socialist majority. Next came the conservative, and last, but showing strongly, a liberal. The government's power in the House of Commons is not affected by this, but it's one more sign of discontent. The unions announcing new demands are the building trades and the railwaymen. They make it quite plain that part of the increases they want is to cover their members from the effects of recent government financial policies. This is Bob Abernethy, NBC News, London. The United Nations General Assembly meets at 3 o'clock this afternoon, New York time, to resume its debate on the Middle East. Three days of delay have failed to bring about any improvement in the crisis between Syria and Turkey, and the delegates are going back to their deliberations. Western delegates are preparing speeches charging the Soviet Union with stirring up the tension to increase its own influence in the Middle East. No doubt the communist delegates have speeches of their own, accusing the United States of responsibility for the disturbance. Eventually, some kind of commission may be formed to investigate the situation. But for an on-the-spot report now on the Middle East, we call in NBC correspondent Wells Hangen in Cairo. Syria and Egypt, in effect, told King Saud today to withdraw his mediation offer or have it thrown in his face. Their new, tougher line coincides with reports that Soviet troops now under the command of Marshal Rokossovsky, are maneuvering with atomic weapons near the Turkish border. One influential Cairo daily says Rokossovsky's appointment shows there must be huge forces under his command, meaning Russia still thinks war is imminent. In Damascus, Syria's ailing President Kowatli has finally bowed to leftist pressure and asked Saudi Arabia to cancel its offer to mediate the Turkish-Syrian dispute. Syrian army leaders and politicians will press their charges against Turkey with Moscow's support in the UN Assembly later today. Syria says four Turkish planes trespassed near the port of Latakia yesterday, while another Turkish craft overflew a Syrian border town. This is Wells Hangen, NBC News, Cairo. All countries were listening for word from Moscow on how Sputnik was doing. The U.S. was focusing on reports that its carrier rocket was outpacing the satellite, while also continuing to push its own space advancements. The Russians have released a new report this morning on the flight of Sputnik just three weeks after the Earth satellite was launched. We hear about that from Irving R. Levine of NBC News in Moscow. The Sputnik's carrier rocket now is so far ahead of the Sputnik that it's behind it again. Perhaps this statement takes a bit of explaining. Well, the daily Soviet communique on the movement of the satellite has been telling how many miles ahead of the satellite is the expended rocket that carried the Sputnik into orbit around the Earth and then began going around with it. The rocket, by spiraling closer to Earth each time around, has gotten so far in front of the Sputnik that it's now two-thirds of the way around the world ahead of the Sputnik. Stated another way, the rocket is now a third of the world behind the Sputnik. And that's the way the daily Soviet communique chooses to state it today. The communique adds that in several days the rocket will bypass the Sputnik again. Still, though, the Russians are saying nothing about how close to the Earth the rocket has come and how much longer it may be expected to stay aloft. This is Irving R. Levine, NBC News, Moscow. 
The United States has been sending up a shower of rockets of its own before and since the launching of Sputnik. The latest, a far side rocket of the Air Force, is reported to have gone up yesterday almost 4,000 miles. If confirmed, that would surpass all known records for altitude reached by any projectile, including Sputnik. The far side was launched from a platform supported by a balloon over the Inuetok Atoll in the Pacific. A briefing on the results will be held this morning in the Pentagon. On Saturday, October 26th, Sputnik 1's batteries ran out after its 326th orbit around the Earth. The following Monday, Chitzak Ben Zvi was re elected president of Israel by the Knesset Congress. The next day, Moshe Dweck threw a grenade in the Knesset chambers, injuring several ministers. In the wake of Turkish elections, riots broke out in six different locations. And in Flagstaff, Arizona, a U.S. Air Force tanker plane crashed into a mountain, killing all 16 crew members. Now, hear this. Tonight you have a date with Life and the World, the exciting new radio program that explores in sound the picture stories in each week's issue of Life magazine. Now to fascinating human interest features, there's added a new dimension, the dimension of sound. The actual voices of the people most intimately associated with stories of human interest gathered from the four corners of the earth. Keep your date with Life and the World tonight and every weeknight over most of these same NBC stations. And now, more news. The first anniversary of the Hungarian rebellion repressed by the Russians has passed quietly. The Russians are getting ready to celebrate joyfully another anniversary of the Bolshevik revolution next month. But all may not be so quiet as it seems in the communist empire, so let's try to get a report now from Jim Robinson of NBC News in Tokyo. On an island near Okinawa, 11 Chinese tell how may, they made their desperate but successful escape from Red China. Anti-Red passengers forced a ship's captain and part of the crew to change course and sail for Formosa. One sailor was killed, another tossed overboard, and the captain wounded in a bloody fight over control of the vessel. After subduing the pro-communist elements, the passengers discovered they knew nothing of sailing the ship, let alone navigating it. For 11 days, they tossed on stormy seas, most of them without food or water. Also, the ship ran out of fuel. Finally, the landing at the American-controlled Okinawan Island. Next stop, Formosa. This is Jim Robinson, NBC News, Tokyo. The French cabinet crisis has been complicated this morning by spreading strikes. Covering that story is NBC's Leaf Eid in Paris. For the second time in nine days, France is flat on its back. Today's strike is near general, called by the communist-led CGT Federation and the Catholic CFTC labor group. French railroads are dead. Paris, bus, and subway systems are strike-bound. Transatlantic planes are being routed to other countries. Telegrams and letters are not being delivered. Garbage is piling up. The construction, metalworking, and shipbuilding industries are tied up tightly. We may have a water shortage before the day is out. Intercity telephone service is shaky. And before nightfall, we expect news of another clash between the violent shipyard workers of San Nazaire and thousands of guard mobile and federal riot troops. In last evening's clash, one worker was killed, 30 others sent to the hospital in a battle in which tear gas bombs and cobblestones rained like confetti and rifle butts were in free play. There were also battles at Nantes and Le Havre. Only the refusal of socialist unions to strike today saved France from complete paralysis. Amid this anarchy, Guy Mollet tries to form a government. His chances look better, but he's still not sure of making it. This is Leaf Eid, NBC News, Paris. Now again, your announcer. Right now, the World Health Organization of the United Nations is working to conquer dozens of dread diseases, many of them found right here in the United States. If this United Nations work continues at its present pace, the coming generations may never know many of the diseases we now fear most. The United Nations works in many other ways, too. For example, the UN's Food and Agriculture Organization teaches people in underdeveloped areas how to produce the essentials of life for themselves. They learn to stand on their own two feet, to need less help from outside. Most important of all, this United Nations work is our best hope for peace, because well-fed, well-clothed people 
don't nurture the discontent and hatreds that can lead to war. The UN works toward permanent peace. For the booklet, The UN in Action, write to U.S. Committee for the UN, Box 1957, Washington 13, D.C. That's the U.S. Committee for the UN, Box 1957, Washington 13, D.C. Now again, the World News Roundup. The Executive Council of the AFL-CIO meeting in Washington is not content to rest with its suspension yesterday of the International Brotherhood of Teamsters. The Council proceeds today to investigate the Bakers and United Textile Workers. They, too, are charged with corruption, and they, too, may be suspended. Suspension of the Teamsters from AFL-CIO membership will hold until the union removes its president-elect, James R. Hoffa, and otherwise gets rid of alleged corrupt elements. This is Henry Cassidy. And that's the NBC World News Roundup, produced by NBC News. Boxing tonight from Madison Square Garden. You'll get all the action on Cavalcade of Sports over most of these NBC stations. Mm -hmm.